Goldsmith at 8 o'clock p.m. <clears throat> As with all university events, these are free, open to the public, and guaranteed to make you wiser and happier, you. or your time will cheerfully be refunded to you at the end of the line. <laughs> U.S. Poet Laureate Billy Collins is the author of six books, and three of these have broken sales records for poetry in the United <clears throat> States. <clears throat> I know that's not a lot, but it does break sales records for poetry in the United States. His work has been published in Poetry Magazine, American Poetry Review, American Scholar, Harper's, Paris Review, and The New Yorker. He has received fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Guggenheim Foundation. And in 1992, he received a ferocious sounding award when he was chosen by the New York Public Library to serve as <coughs> Literary Lion. <coughs> Born at 11.57 p.m. on a night during the 20th century, <laughs> <laughs> Collins is professor at Lehman College of City University of New York, and he lives in Summers, New York now. His poems often start out light and take a turn toward enlightenment. Collins has said that he considers humor, quote, a door into the serious. His readings are renowned for their calm, sustaining wisdom, and deadpan humor. Deadpan. The Oxford English Dictionary defines deadpan as expressionless, impassive, unemotional, detached, impersonal. Although deadpan can be used to simply mean unemotional, it is most often heard in the context of humor or joke telling, where a deadpan, mock serious delivery often amplifies the effect of a good joke. <clears throat> the word deadpan has theatrical origins, first appearing in the New York Times in 1928 <coughs> in an article citing actor Buster Keaton as the quintessential deadpan comic. It was frequently used in the show business variety, daily variety around that time. The essence of deadpan comes in the use of pan which was theatrical slang for face, reflecting the use of pan to mean skull, found in writing as early as 1330. So deadpan is simply another way of saying expressionless face. Pancake, then, meaning a kind of thick makeup often used in theater, first appeared in 1937 as a trademark of the Max Factor and Company, and it may well be a bit of a pun itself, referring both to the thickness of the product which was incidentally marketed in a broad pancake-shaped container, and to the fact that it forms a sort of cake on the actor's pan. Dead pan, pancake, cake pan. <clears throat> now, when a joke falls dead, <laughs> you're ahead of me, aren't you? <laughs> It is said to be flatter than a pancake. And when a cake falls, that is no joke either. Cake, however, is more often associated with birth, as in birthday cake, than with death, <coughs> except in the case of Marie Antoinette. <laughs> Cakes come in contradictory forms, such as cake of mud or cake of soap. And dead can take on confusing forms too such as in the sentence, you can be dead sure there is a harbor dead ahead, but come to a dead stop there, or you'll be <coughs> dead in the water and as good as dead. Pans often signify trouble, but not grave danger, as in skillets thrown in anger, or the phrase, out of the frying pan and into the fire. And then opening Pandora's box led to Pan-Hellenic pandemonium. Hold that for a minute, thanks. Excuse me. A panhandler is someone trying to stave off death by getting a living, and someone panning for gold is after pretty much the same thing at pretty much the same rate of success. When a critic pans a performance, he more often than not sounds its death knell. And still, if everything pans out here tonight, and Billy Collins cakes on more of his deathless insight, you are in for a lively, yet decidedly deadpan treat. Billy Collins. Thanks. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, thank you. Sure.
devil here. here. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Ray, for sharing those free associations with us. <laughs> um, now we're on. Thank you. I can, I can. I'm like a deer in the headlights here, but I'll trust that you'll. Whenever I read where the lights are so bright that I can't see anybody, I, I start to, as the reading goes on, I think they're leaving one by one. And then they, <laughs> when they bring the lights up, they'll just be my uncle or somebody. <laughs> um, I was thinking of reading something about a pen, but I won't do that. <laughs> I do have, I, I'll get to it though, I have a poem about a pen, but I will, I have, um, I'm very reader friendly, I think. I'm very, I think it's out of, not so much out of respect for the reader, but out of loneliness. When I'm writing, I need to feel like someone's there and that I'm not just committing an act of literature all by myself. So, recently my last few books have started with a poem to the reader as a kind of welcoming mat and, um, I thought I'd read uh, this one, which is not in a book, but it's it's called "You, Comma Reader," and it's to it's to you, my reader, if you've read me. You reader, I wonder how you are going to feel when you find out that I wrote this instead of you, that it was I who got up early to sit in the kitchen and mention with a pen the rain-soaked windows, the ivy wallpaper, and the goldfish circling in its bowl. Go ahead and turn aside, bite your lip and tear out a page. But listen, it was just a matter of time before one of us happened to notice the unlit candles and the clock humming on the wall. Plus, nothing happened that morning. A song on the radio, a car whistling along the road outside, and I was only thinking about the shakers of salt and pepper that were standing side by side on a placemat. I wondered if they had become friends after all these years, or if they were still strangers to one another, like you and I, who managed to be known and no unknown to each other at the same time. Me at this table with a bowl of pears, you leaning in a doorway near some blue hydrangeas reading this. This is a poem called, um, I don't know, do you know what a lanyard is? That's a kind of, a, I don't know if that's a totally outdated term or not. How about this for product placement? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'll go with this. It's called, it's called The Lanyard, right? The Lanyard. The other day, as I was ricocheting slowly off the blue walls of this room, bouncing from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, I found myself in the L section of the dictionary where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more suddenly into the past, a past where I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one if that's what you did with them. But that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts and I gave her a lanyard. 
she nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead, then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim, and I in turn presented her with a lanyard. <laughs> here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education. And here is your lanyard, I replied, <laughs> which I made with a little help from a counselor. Here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones, and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. <laughs> and here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the archaic truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hands. I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. Which I, I truly did believe at the time. Um, thank you. I'll just assume those applause are for my mother. <laughs> and not, poor dear, and not for me. This is a poem with a little, um, it refers to another poem. The other, the other poem is a Yeats poem called the, the Wild Swans at Cool. It's the poem in which Yeats sees all these swans on the water and he starts to count them. And he gets to 59 and then all the swans take off. And uh, I usually in the morning take a walk around this reservoir uh, with the dog, and uh, there are often swans out there, and I, I've, I usually count them. And for a while, I just thought, well, Yeats counted them, so I should count them. It's part of like a poet's, he did it, or what, what's the harm, you know, just feel a little bit more like Yeats. And then I got a little, I got a sense of what he might have been doing, very you know, guesswork, but I, because swans are notorious for kind of hooking up for a long period of time, I uh, when I would come up with an even number, I would feel kind of good, like everyone was paired off, you know, they all like had their mates out there. And if I came up with an odd number, it would seem like, you know, I'd look out there to see which one was like the crazy bachelor or the, you know, the widow or, you know, so I was a little unsettled to have an odd number. Uh, but that's the little reference. But the poem is really about the word genius and it tries to trace kind of the evolution of how the world word genius changes as we uh, go along in our education. Genius. Genius was what they called you in high school if you tripped on a shoelace in the hall and all your books went flying. <laughs> or if you walked into an open locker door, you would be known as Einstein, <laughs> who imagined riding a streetcar into infinity Later, genius became someone who could take a sliver of chalk and squire pi a hundred places out beyond the decimal point. Or someone painting on his back on a scaffold, or a man drawing a water wheel in a margin, or spinning out a little night music. But earlier this week on a wooded path, I thought the swans afloat on the reservoir were the true geniuses the ones who had figured out how to fly and how to be both beautiful and brutal and how to mate for life. 24 geniuses in all, for I numbered them as Yeats had done, deployed upon the calm, crystalline surface. 48 if we count their white reflections, or an even 50 if you want to throw in me and the dog running up ahead who were at least smart enough to be out there that morning, she sniffing the ground, me with my head up in the light morning breeze. And here's a poem that I'm just kind of, I hope I can read it because I've just, it's not quite finished, I'm just jotting 
part of it's written and part of it's typed, so if, <clears throat> I hope I can get through it. It's called um, uh, Evil. Evil. One evening long ago, the two monkeys sitting on either end became tired of always having to cover their ears and mouth with their paws. So they quietly sid slid down from their tree stumps and loped off into the villainous world, one with his arm around the other. And that left one monkey alone in the middle, our hands still clasped over his eyes as the moon came up and fell and rose and now is falling again. Sometimes the darkness and the silence becomes too much to bear and his thin lips part and he asks, are you both still there? But he asks softly as you might in prayer, That's just making a mess of the limerick. <laughs> but let me try out on you. Let me try some of these very tiny, tiny poems. Twisting time. Twisting time. I am twisting again, but not like I did last summer or the summer before or the summer before that. I am twisting more slowly now because it is cold and I have grown heavy and there is hardly any wind. Breaking up, like breaking up is hard to do, breaking up. Like the nomadic dollar I pass to the man behind the cash register you are off to other hands. <laughs> you must keep the title of this very short poem in mind. And if you don't like any one of these, another one will just be along in any <laughs> second. So. But this one's called Refrigerator Light. Refrigerator Light. The minute she slams the door, I stop thinking about her. Here. This is called The Silver Diner After Midnight. Has that revolving cake stand always been there, or did some men install it while you and I sat here at the counter not saying anything? 
autumn, autumn. That light blue sweater you left on the port swing this evening makes me wonder if it would be possible to figure out a way not to die. And this one's called pupil, which takes advantage of the pun, the two meanings of pupil. Pupil, pupil, a hole in the eye, a, the black well in the midst of a flower, an iris, or she who gives you the eye sideways on her way out of class after the others. <laughs> <clears throat> this is called RCA Victor. It's about the dog. Do you know what that dog's name is? Nipper. Very good. Um, RCA Victor. The dog sits by the Victrola, his head cocked, listening to the voice of his master and thinking how different he looks today. <laughs> smaller, like a box, and his head an ornate megaphone. Where are the legs he needs to walk me? Where are the hands that throw my ball? The dog wonders and begins to shiver. And I'll give you one, maybe one more of these little ones called Koan in the Rain. You want to know the sound of one hand clapping? It is the same as the sound of the other hand holding the umbrella, only slightly louder. <laughs> so those are, all right, so those are those. Now you have to listen to longer, <laughs> spoiling you with this. You have to listen to longer poems now. Well, I'll give you, I'll, 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 I'll break you in gradually. I'll read you a couple of still smaller poems. Um, this is something that you hear on the radio a lot. I mean, you hear versions of this. Um, it's called Surprise. This, according to the voice on the radio, the host of a musical, of a classical music program, no less. This is the birthday of Vivaldi. He would be 325 years old today, quite bent over, I would imagine, <laughs> and not able to see much through his watery eyes. Surely he would be deaf by now, the clothes flaking off him, hair pitiably sparse. But we would throw a party for him anyway, a surprise party where everyone would hide behind the furniture <laughs> to listen for the tap of his cane on the pavement and the sound of his dry, persistent cough. <laughs> That's little Vivaldi. Can I, I just always picture these when they say that you'd be that old. I always picture them instantly at that age. <laughs> Well, I'll read another short one later, but um, this is a poem, a very uh, sort of, I, I, a poem I dedicated to a friend of mine who uh, I went to college with, and he, um, he lived in Vermont, and he still lives there, and uh, I lived in, in and around New York City, and we used to go back and forth and visit each other um, now and again, and I'd go up to Vermont, and he'd teach me like, you know, fishing and cross-country skiing, and then he'd come down to New York and I'd teach him, like, you know, stuff I knew about the city, like smoking and drinking, uh, were the primary things I taught him. And this is one of the things he tried to teach me about living in the country that I, ha I had a hard time believing at first, and it's called the country. I wondered about you when you told me never to leave a box of wooden strike anywhere matches lying around the house 
because the mice might get into them and start a fire. <laughs> but your face was absolutely straight when you twisted the lid down on the round tin where the matches, you said, are always stowed. Who could sleep that night? <laughs> Who could whisk away the thought of the one unlikely mouse padding along a cold water pipe behind the floral wallpaper, gripping a single wooden match <laughs> between the needles of his teeth? Who could not see him rounding a corner, the blue tip scratching against a rough-hewn beam, the sudden flare, and the creature for one bright, shining moment, suddenly thrust ahead of his time, now a fire starter, now a torch bearer, in a forgotten ritual, little brown druid illuminating some ancient night. Who could fail to notice, lit up in the blazing insulation, the tiny looks of wonderment on the faces of his fellow mice? one-time inhabitants of what once was your house in the country. <laughs> Thank you. This, this poem is uh, about a, really, a fairly common experience of, of getting a song uh, stuck in your head for the day or the week or whatever. But um, as you know, there is a kind of direct ratio between the badness of the song and its Velcro-like power <laughs> to stick in your head. Um, they say that you can, you know, there are various folk remedies that have developed for this <laughs> affliction. And one of the most common is that you can, if you, get a, if you play a good song over and over again, you can blow out the bad song. But I find that this just annoys the bad song. <laughs> and the bad song just digs in. You, know? you can't, you have to, um... There is one song, though, there's a song called My Bucket's Got a Hole in It that uh, will, just, will destroy any song in its path. <laughs> for some reason or other. And uh, the title of the, the poem is More Than a Woman. More Than a Woman. Originally it was called Fill Me Up Buttercup, but now... <laughs> it's actually the only poem I know where you can just change the title. You know, you know, it just has no effect on the poem. Anyway, More Than a Woman. Ever since I woke up today, a song has been playing uncontrollably in my head, a tape looping over the spools of the brain, a rosary in the hands of a frenetic nun, mad fan belt of a tune. It must have escaped from the radio last night on the drive home and tunneled while I slept from my ears to the very center of my cortex. It is a song so cloying and vapid, I won't even bother mentioning the title. But on it plays as if I were a turntable covered with dancing children and their spooky pantomimes, as if everything I had ever learned was slowly being replaced by its slinky chords and the puffballs of its lyrics. It played while I watered the plant and continued when I brought in the mail and fanned out the letters on a table. It repeated itself when I took a walk and watched from a bridge brown leaves floating in the channels of a current. In the late afternoon, it seemed to fade, but I heard it again at the restaurant when I peered in at the lobsters lying at the bottom of an illuminated tank which was filled to the brim with their copious tears. And now at this dark window in the middle of the night, I am beginning to think I could be listening to the music of the spheres, the sound no one ever hears because it has been playing forever. Only the spheres are colored pool balls and the music is oozing from a jukebox 
whose lights I can just make out through the clouds. Here's a poem I will play or sing. A little poem for, we were talking about dogs tonight, and uh, this is a little poem for my dog. The poem is called Dharma, which is not that I wouldn't inflict that name on a dog, but it's not even on a dog. But, uh, but the, the poem is called Dharma. The way the dog trots out the front door every morning without a hat or an umbrella, without any money or the keys to her doghouse, never fails to fill the saucer of my heart with milky admiration. Who provides a finer example of a life without encumbrance? Thoreau in his curtainless hut with a single plate and a single spoon, Gandhi with his staff and his knotted diapers. <laughs> Off she goes into the material world with nothing but her brown coat and her modest blue collar, following only her wet nose, the twin portals of her steady breathing, followed only by the plume of her tail. If only she did not shove the cat aside every morning, <laughs> and eat all his food. <laughs> what a model of self-containment she would be. <laughs> what a paragon of earthly detachment. If only she were not so eager for a rub behind the ears, so acrobatic in her welcomes, if only I were not her god. I sold that last line from Kenneth Burke, who said that dogs, he thought dogs were the luckiest creatures on earth because they got to live with their gods, for better or worse, or, the, or their devils, I guess, in some cases. Here's a, um, here's a more formal poem. It's called Sonnet, and it refers to um, kind of the inventor of the sonnet, or at least someone who got it the sonnet in good enough shape so it could be exported into to England. Uh, Petrarch, the Italian poet, medieval poet, and Petrarch um, kind of fine-tuned the sonnet and he um, dedicated all of his sonnets, his love sonnets, to a woman he called Laura. And I just call my poem Sonnet. All we need is 14 lines. Well, 13 now. <laughs> And after this one, just a dozen, <laughs> to launch a little ship on love's storm-tossed seas, then only ten more left like rows of beans. How easily it goes, unless you get Elizabethan and insist the iambic bongos must be played and rhymes positioned at the ends of lines, one for every station of the cross. But hang on here while we make the turn into the final six, where all will be resolved, where longing and heartache will find an end, where Laura will tell Petrarch to put down his pen, take off those crazy medieval tights, <laughs> blow out the lights, and come at last to bed. I wanted to get those two together. You know, those, because there's no, there's no real love making in the sonnet. It's all, if you read the, you know, the Elizabethan, it's all panting and tail wagging and flattery. But I oh, was speaking of flattery. I should read this. I read this poem. Um, you know, many poems you'll hear in the classroom, or even outside it. Uh, are about other poems. You know, there's Harold Bloom, like there's no such thing as a poem, there are just relationships between poems. This poem takes uh, the first two lines of someone else's poem and just steals them and uses them as the beginning of my poem. And um, it's a rather flagrant, it would be like just shop, like walking out of the 7-Eleven with two Slurpees and not even paying. You know, it's a very flagrant kind of, kind of a, a, a theft. 
So I came across this poem in a magazine by someone named Jacques Criquillon, and I looked in the back of the magazine, and it just said, Jacques Criquillon lives in Belgium. So I thought, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll, never, I'll never know. So I just took his lines and, um, and, and did this to them. So his two lines, I give him credit at the beginning, a little epigraph, but his two lines are this. He says, you are the, this is like Petrarchan comparisons. He says, you are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. And I called my poem Litany, and I just restarted his poem. Litany. You are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. You are the dew on the morning grass and the burning wheel of the sun. You are the white apron of the baker and the marsh bird suddenly in flight. However, you are not the wind in the orchard, the plums on the counter, or the house of cards. And you are certainly not the pine-scented air. There is no way you are the pine-scented air. <laughs> It is possible that you are the fish under the bridge, maybe even the pigeon on the general's head, but you are not even close to being the field of cornflowers at dusk. And a quick look in the mirror will show that you are neither the boots in the corner nor the boat asleep in its boathouse. It might interest you to know, speaking of the plentiful imagery of the world, that I am the sound of rain on the roof. <laughs> I also happen to be the shooting star, the evening paper blowing down an alley, and the basket of chestnuts on the kitchen table. I am also the moon in the trees and the blind woman's teacup. But don't worry, I am not the bread and the knife. You are still the bread and the knife. <laughs> you will always be the bread and the knife not to mention the crystal goblet and somehow the wine. <laughs> Thank you. So this is a poem about another, this is also a poem about another poem, it's a poem about a haiku, and I, it's called Japan, and it has to, um, has to do with those little 17-syllable Japanese in origin uh, poems of natural observation. Um, there are a lot of um, unintentional haiku. I, I, anything you say that's 17 syllables is a potential haiku. So that it's probably impossible to get through a day of normal social intercourse without saying something that's 17 syllables long. So probably every day we're, we, we turn out a couple of haiku without knowing it. Uh, there's, um, I collect these things, so I find like, um, I collect 17 syllable utterances. All the, all the lyrics to Moonlight in Vermont are haiku. Like Pennies in the Stream, Falling Leaves of Sycamore, each, each verse is haiku. Uh, Old Mother Hubbard, etc., that's a haiku. When, when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. Seventeen. <laughs> They're all over the place. There's a conspiracy theory about these haiku. Here's one I caught on a train, a sign on a train in England. It said, uh, attention, when the train is not stopped, it will be constantly moving. <laughs> and that has a very zen <laughs> truthfulness to it. The poem is called Japan. Today I passed the time reading a favorite haiku, saying the few words over and over. It feels like eating the same small perfect grape again and again. I walk through the house reciting it and leave its letters falling through the air of every room. I stand by the big silence of the piano and say it. I say it in front of a painting of the sea. I tap it as rhythm on an empty shelf. I listen to myself saying it 
then I say it without listening, then I hear it without saying it. And when the dog looks up at me, I kneel down on the floor and whisper it into each of his long white ears. It's the one about the one-ton temple bell with the moth sleeping on its surface. And every time I say it, I feel the excruciating pressure of the moth on the surface of the iron bell. When I say it at the window, the bell is the world, and I am the moth resting there. When I say it into the mirror, I am the heavy bell, and the moth is life with its papery wings. And later, when I say it to you in the dark, you are the bell, and I am the tongue of the bell, ringing you, and the moth has flown from its line and moves like a hinge in the air above our bed. <clears throat> a poem called Forgetfulness. I wanted to, uh, I got in inspired, if that's the, if that's not too romantic a word for what happens before you write a poem, uh, by an article uh, by this guy, Patrick Susskind, a freaky German novelist who wrote an article called uh, Literary Amnesia, and it was about uh, him coming to the realization that he'd spent almost all of his life reading and he'd forgotten just about everything he'd read. So um, I started writing a poem about just forgetting what you read and it led to other kinds of, of forgetting. Forgetfulness. The name of the author is the first to go, followed obediently by the title, the plot, the heartbreaking conclusion, the entire novel, which suddenly becomes one you have never read, never even heard of. It is as if one by one, the memories you used to harbor decided to retire to the southern hemisphere of the brain, to a little fishing village where there are no phones. Long ago, you kissed the names of the nine muses goodbye, and you watched the quadratic equation pack its bag. <laughs> and even now, as you memorize the order of the planets, something else is slipping away, a state flower perhaps, <laughs> the address of an uncle, the capital of Paraguay. Whatever it is you are struggling to remember, it is not poised on the tip of your tongue not even lurking in some obscure corner of your spleen. It has floated away down a dark mythological river whose name begins with an L. <laughs> as far as you can recall. <coughs> well, on your own way to oblivion, where you will join those who have forgotten even how to swim and how to ride a bicycle. No wonder you rise in the middle of the night to look up the date of a famous battle in a book on war. No wonder the moon in the window seems to have drifted out of a love poem that you used to know by heart. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So that, that applause is not for my mother, that's for me. That's good. <laughs> um, I'd like to follow that poem with this poem, um, which has to do, um, I think a lot of, some of these poems are written a little bit, I mean, the, the, they start out of being a little annoyed about something. And the thing I was annoyed about was that pervasive habit we used to have in, back in the 20th century about, <laughs> it's silly to say that, but, it's true, it's over. Um, get, o get over it. <laughs> but so much happened in the 20th century. You know, like skateboarding and you know, like World War I. It was amazing. I mean, all this, you probably have your own you know, personal favorites. But, uh, but we used, what we used to do, we talk very knowledgeably about these decades. And we talk about the 50s and the 
60s and the 40s and the 90s and <clears throat> all we'd have to do is say like the 80s or she's very 80s or it's a 90s thing and this would be a kind of code um, and also I think ultimately a way of trying to understand this uh, elusive thing called the past so this poem is called Nostalgia and uh, it's kind of a takeoff on that habit Nostalgia Remember the 1340s? We were doing a dance called the catapult. You always wore brown, the color craze of the decade. And I was draped in one of those capes that were popular, the ones with unicorns and pomegranates and needlework. Everyone would pause for beer and onions in the afternoon. And at night, we would play a game called Find the Cow. <laughs> Everything was hand-lettered back then, not like today. Where has the summer of 1572 gone? <laughs> Brocade and sonnet marathons were all the rage. We used to dress up in the flags of rival baronies and conquer one another in cold rooms of stone. Out on the dance floor, we were all doing the struggle <laughs> while your sister practiced the Daphne all alone in her room. We borrowed the jargon of farriers for our slang. These days, language seems transparent, a badly broken code. The 1790s will never come again. Childhood was big. People would take walks to the very tops of hills and write down what they saw in their journals without speaking. Our collars were high, our hats were extremely soft. We would surprise each other with alphabets made of twigs. It was a wonderful time to be alive or even dead. I am very fond of the period between 1815 and 1821. Europe trembled while we sat still for our portraits. And I would love to return to 1901, if only for a moment, time enough to wind up a music box and do a few dance steps, or shoot me back to 1922 or 1941, or at least let me recapture the serenity of last month when we picked berries together and glided through afternoons in a canoe. Even this morning would be an improvement over the present, I was in the garden then, surrounded by the hum of bees and the Latin names of flowers, watching the early light flash off the slanted windows of the greenhouse and silver the limbs on the rows of dark hemlocks. As usual, I was thinking about the moments of the past, letting my memory rush over them like water rushing over the stones on the bottom of a stream. I was even thinking a little about the future, that place where people are doing a dance we cannot imagine, a dance whose name we can only guess. <laughs> Thank you. This is a poem called Love, and it's a poem a very simple description that was written very quickly and often I suppose one dimension of writing is you would call maybe the sketcher's dimension where you know if you had a charcoal pen or whatever you just want to get it down you see you know like a contour drawing and this was something I witnessed and I just but literally just wanted to record it in some way and it's called love the boy at the far end of the train car kept looking behind him as if he were afraid or expecting someone. And then she appeared in the glass door of the forward car and he rose and opened the door and let her in. And she entered the car carrying a large black case in the unmistakable shape of a cello. She looked like an angel with a high forehead and somber eyes, and her hair was tied up behind her neck with a black bow. And because of all that, he seemed a little awkward 
in his happiness to see her, whereas she was simply there, perfectly existing as a creature with a soft face who played the cello. And the reason I am writing this on the back of a manila envelope now that they have left the train together is to tell you that when she turned to lift the large delicate cello onto the overhead rack, I saw him looking up at her and what she was doing, the way the eyes of saints are painted when they are looking up at God, when he is doing something remarkable, something that identifies him as God. <coughs> Sweet couple, the kind of couple you wish, you wish them good luck when you see them. Here's a poem about teaching. It's a poem about teaching, probably teaching a little too long. <laughs> I was trying to figure out one day with a colleague of mine, you know, if we got all the students we had ever taught together in the same place, like what this would be like besides the sort of frightening spectacle of like a lot of angry <laughs> uh, students full of misinformation. Um, and this was uh, one way I figured out I, that was a way to put them together. It's called Schoolsville. Glancing over my shoulder at the past, I realize the number of students I have taught is enough to populate a small town. I can see it nestled in a paper landscape, chalk dust flurrying down an evening. In winter, nights dark as a blackboard. The population ages, but never graduates. <laughs> On hot afternoons, they sweat the final in the park. And when it's cold, they shiver around stoves, reading disorganized essays out loud. A bell rings on the hour, and everybody zigzags into the streets with their books. I forgot all their last names first, and their first names last, in alphabetical order. <laughs> but the boy who always had his hand up is an alderman and owns the haberdashery. The girl who signed her papers in lipstick leans against the drugstore, smoking brushing her hair like a machine. Their grades are sewn into their clothes like references to Hawthorne. The A's stroll along with other A's. The D's honk whenever they pass another D. <laughs> All the creative writing students recline on the courthouse lawn and play the lute. Wherever they go, they form a big circle. <laughs> Needless to say, I am the mayor. I live in the white colonial at Maple and Main. I rarely leave the house. The car deflates in the driveway. Vines twirl around the porch swing. Once in a while, a student knocks on the door with a term paper 15 years late. <laughs> or a question about Yates or double spacing. And sometimes one will appear in a window pane to watch me lecturing the wallpaper, quizzing the chandelier, <laughs> reprimanding the air. It's all, it's all gold, basically, so it's sort of hard to know <laughs> where exactly to dig in here. I like poems with uh, helpful titles. I, one of my favorite titles is um, by Thomas Gray, the English poet. Um, uh, called, it's called Ode on the Death of a Favorite Cat Drowned in a Tub of Goldfishes. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but that gets me right away. <laughs> it's, it's enough to get me going. And I, I found a great title, uh, a woman named Charlotte Smith. She was a contemporary of Wordsworth. 
wrote a poem around 1805 or something. And the title is <coughs> On Being Cautioned Against Walking on a Headland Overlooking the Sea Because It Was Frequented by a Lunatic. <laughs> the poem's not very good, but... So this is at least a little helpful, maybe. It's called I Chopped Some Parsley While Listening to Art Blakey's Version of Three Blind Mice. <laughs> so you have some information already. <coughs> and I start wondering how they came to be blind. If it was congenital, they could be brothers and sisters. And I think of the poor mother brooding over her sightless young triplets. Or was it a common accident? All three caught in a searing explosion, a firework perhaps. If not, if each came to his or her blindness separately, how did they ever manage to find one another? <laughs> Would it not be difficult for a blind mouse to locate even one fellow mouse with vision, let alone two other blind ones? <laughs> And how, in their tiny darkness, could they possibly have run after a farmer's wife, or anyone else's wife for that matter, not to mention why? Just so she could cut off their tails with a carving knife is the cynic's answer. But the thought of them without eyes, and now without tails, to trail through the moist grass, or slip around the corner of a baseboard, has the cynic who always lounges within me up off his couch and at the window trying to hide the rising softness that he feels. By now I am on to dicing an onion which might account for the wet stinging in my own eyes though Freddie Hubbard's mournful trumpet on Blue Moon which happens to be the next cut cannot be said to be making matters any better. <coughs> I'm having, this is such a good audience, I'm having too good a time, I should stop because this, this, uh, these bells are going to go off any minute, I just noticed. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to end with this poem, um, if I can get it in before the bells. It's called, uh, everyone, um, we mostly, poets write about death, this is what we do for a living, it's our, it's our, <laughs> Job descriptions, write about death. Look out the window, learn the names of flowers, write about death. Um, if you have a birthday you can divide by 10, you have to write a poem about death. So uh, a lot of poems on turning 50 and 30 and 40 and whatever. So um, I tried to like make a little fun of that. This poem I think got, I got carried away with it uh, in a bit, but it's called On Turning 10. on turning 10. The whole idea of it makes me feel like I'm coming down with something. Something worse than any stomach ache or the headaches I get from reading in bad light. A kind of measles of the spirit, a mumps of the psyche. You tell me it is too early to be looking back, but that is because you have forgotten the perfect simplicity of being one and the beautiful complexity introduced by two. But I can lie on my bed and remember every digit. At four, I was an Arabian wizard. I could make myself invisible by drinking a glass of milk a certain way. At seven, I was a soldier. At nine, a prince. But now I am mostly at the window watching the late afternoon light. Back then, it never fell so solemnly against the side of my treehouse and my bicycle never leaned against the garage as it does today, all the dark blue speed drained out of it. This is the beginning of sadness, I say to myself, as I walk through the universe in my sneakers. It is time to say goodbye to my imaginary friends, time to turn the first big number. It seems only yesterday, I used to believe there was nothing under my skin but light. If you cut me, I would shine. But now, when I fall upon the sidewalks of life, I skin my knees, I bleed. Thank you.
If you want. Okay. This is go in peace, or if you have a question you want to ask, ask a peaceful question of me. Or could you put the house lights up a little bit so I can see the, put the beautiful faces to these applause? Um, but if you, um, there is a kind of built in little question and answer session. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to. Uh, uh, you could be completely satisfied. I wouldn't blame you, but but if you had <laughs> but if you had any lingering curiosities, I would try to um, satisfy them. It's very hard to see, but could you read 9/11? <coughs> um, yeah, no. Read the whole thing. Uh, it's well, it's not called 9/11, but I I did write a poem for that occasion under uh, congressional pressure. Um, it's called The Names, is the poem I think you're thinking about. And uh, I think actually Pinsky wrote 9-11. He's the former <laughs> poet laureate. But I, uh, not to be uh, less than accommodating, but I've, I just decided, uh, I read that poem before Congress, the joint, there was a joint session of Congress in New York on September 6th at Federal Hall where Washington George Washington was inaugurated, and uh, I stood actually uh, on the slab uh, that George Washington stood on, and his Bible was there. It was quite moving. And about 300 Congress people came up from Washington on a train, which was uh, F-16s were fl flying up and down this train corridor. So it was pretty serious security. And um, I read the poem then. I read it a couple times on the radio on September 11th. But I just kind of, I decided I'd never read it again. I just thought, I, I just want to leave it there. And um, I don't want to make it part of my repertory or whatever. I hope you understand. I just, I just thought I'd leave it in its place there. So, no. Little kids, but some of the poems are about cars and about sports. I mean, if I, if I came across a poem that seemed like irresistibly to appeal to high school kids because of subject matter, I, I certainly didn't didn't um, you know stop did that didn't stop me from choosing those poems. But those were really the 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 four criteria as I thought it out. And there, it's really hard to find poems that are short, clear, clean, and and good. And they're clean only because I mean I know you know high school students are are pretty hip. Um, sexually and, and otherwise, but I just didn't, I, it was very defensive on my part, I just didn't want uh, a kind of uh, administrator uh, somewhere, kind of recid I mean, a reactionary administrator to say this, you know, poem has the word breast in it, so we're going to kill the program. So I've just I, I just, I haven't given people like that a chance to get in. But those, those are the, uh, and, and uh, there's going to be a book put out next year called Poetry 180, which will have the have 180 poems in there. There's one right there, yeah. I have a lot of friends who are fairly well-known artists, painters, and they hold some of their paintings in their own private collection. Do you have poems that you hold in your own private collection? Do I have poems that I hold in my own private collection like a painter would? Well, no, because there, this, there's really so little, there's not much of an analogy there, because the painting is one thing. And, the poem you just can Xerox, you know. You can't Xerox a painting. No, I want to get mine out of the house. I suppose if I put a lot of work into a painting, I, if if I only if if you couldn't if you couldn't uh, duplicate a poem, it's a little hard to imagine a world in which print could not be duplicated. But if that were the case, I probably would hold on to it. You know, if I had to uh, if I had to chisel my poems in granite, and 
I, I might hang on to a few of them. <laughs> but the, I think the analogy kind of breaks down. You know, a painting something you can be possessive about. In, in a poem, uh, it's, a poem is everybody's very quickly. Just go down to Kinko's, make a thousand copies of it. Somebody about yes. Um, do you try and, and like put a discipline for yourself to sit down and say, I'm going to write right now, or do you generally wait until like, you can see something or feel something? Yeah, I have no work habits whatsoever. <laughs> uh, I have <laughs> never sat down really and said, I'm going to, I'm going to write, damn it. You know, uh, I always, I wait for something to happen. And I'm, I think, you know, poetry is not something that happens at a desk. I mean, I've written, I've, I've, I think I can tell, you know, because I teach creative writing, I can tell when I read a poem that this poem is, a, is purely a desk activity. It's not the result of anything else but the desire to write something down at a desk. And I think poems that move me are, the, re, are the, the desk work is kind of the, the final result of uh, vigilance, of paying attention to what's around you, uh, to looking at the world in a certain way. Um, so I, uh, you know, Frost says you can't fret a poem into being. So I wait until something happens and I sit down and I write. And that usually, usually happens in, you know, driving or taking a walk or something away from the desk. So I'm a very bad role model as far as writing discipline goes. But it's very idiosyncratic. I mean, some writers sit down in the morning and they, they go to work, you know, and uh, especially novelists, you sort of have to go to work. But, you know, one of them, uh, Max Bierbaum, uh, the American humorist, once said that the hardest part of being a poet was knowing what to do with the other 23 and a half hours of the day. <laughs> So it's not really a labor-intensive activity. Maybe uh, one or two more if there are any questions. Uh, there's one there, yeah. Just say a little louder. Oh, the what I'm reading from. Uh, well, the new book is called, I don't know if they, they, don't, they have it, the new book is called Nine Horses. It's got a picture, it's kind of a cool looking cover, I think. it's got a picture of nine horses on the cover. <laughs> and that just came out last week, actually, so that's all new poems. And then the other, the other book is called Sailing Alone Around the Room, and that's uh, uh, selected poems. And so that has, like, poems from many books. Yeah. 1495, Randy <laughs> One last question? No more questions. That's it. All right, wait, wait. Yes, sir. Um, I'm curious about your fascination about dogs. I'm quite fascinated with them myself. And I, it seems like several of your poems that I've heard you talk and read about are related to dogs. Well, it's not an obsession, really, but I'm very fond of dogs. and. Uh, I had, I've had dogs most of my life. There was a long period of time where I, I didn't have a dog. I was kind of between dogs, and I knew, <laughs> I knew I would get one eventually. But it was interesting because I, during that period without a dog, I would often be, well, sometimes I'd be writing a poem, and uh, the poem would just kind of want to have a dog in it, so I'd just stick a dog in it anyway. i just say, and my dog running ahead of me or something. And then um, during this period, which was you know, a number of years, sometimes after a reading, a dog lover would say, what kind of dog do you have? And I would just make up a breed and I'd say, uh, you know, a Dalmatian, oh really? You know? And i just change the breed around. So I had this like poetry, like virtual dog, you know, but uh, li I have a literary dog. <laughs> but now I have a real dog, a little uh, collie mix, so. Um, one of the, um, 9-11 produced a lot of bad poetry. One of the students in my class wrote a beautiful poem uh, in the aftermath of 9-11. She lived in New York and um, she was actually a Polish immigrant. She's still learning English. Uh, 
but a very good poet. And she wrote a poem about um, looking into her dog's eyes. Now the whole city was in, and not to mention the country, was in trembling state of chaos and uncertainty and the first few days afterward. And the only refuge she could find was to stare at her dog and into these brown eyes of her dog because the dog knew nothing of this, you know? And it was like a little oasis of ahistorical innocence that she could connect with. It was a way of escaping from, from these events. So that was a dog, a dog put to good use. Thank you very much.